Welcome to Law Talk Friday. My name is Susan Soto. I'm a staff attorney in the Conroe branch office at Lone Star Legal Aid. Assisting me today is paralegal Natalia Reese, also from the Conroe branch office. Before we get started this afternoon with our topic, I'd like to remind you that this presentation is intended to serve as legal information and does not replace legal advice. Contact Lone Star Legal Aid at 1-800-733-8394 or visit www.lonestarlegal.org for more information on legal assistance. Lone Star Legal Aid does not discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, gender, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, national origin, ancestry, disability, marital status, or military status in any of its activities or operations. Today, we've invited two guests from Motivation, Education, and Training Incorporated to talk to us about the impact that fathers, grandfathers, fathers-to-be, and father figures might have on legal issues that arise through Lone Star Legal Aid. That could be a family law issue, that could be an eviction situation. There are lots of legal situations where fathers and father figures play an important role in that case and also its aftermath. So I'd like to introduce to you Colin Cange and Donnell Izell from Motivation, Education, and Training Incorporated. Donnell, I'll call on you first today if you'll give us a, an overview of what the program in your office provides. Okay. How you doing, everyone? I'm Donnell. I'm the fatherhood specialist for Med Fatherhood. Um, what we actually do is service fathers and father figures. Um, we don't really have a specific father or father figure that we're looking for. Um, our services are free. We are uh, funded by the federal government, government the Office of Family Assistance. Um, typically, dads join our program for two reasons. Uh, they're looking for employment or they're looking to be a better dad. Um, we service these fathers for free um, through uh, parenting education, employment services, and we will pay for a certification or trade um, once they complete a certain uh, amount of workshop hours. Um, most of our dads are within uh, eight respective counties. Um, as long as the, the gentleman is 18 years or over with the child from zero to 24, um, we can service him. We are one of the only programs that are explicitly serving fathers um, to improve the lifestyle of the children and their partners in uh, disinvested in um, building up the family uh, through the fatherhood role. Thank you, I appreciate that overview. We've got some questions for you this afternoon that um, we think would help the viewers understand better um, what is offered and why this is so important. Again, whether it be in a divorce situation, an eviction, or um, any legal concerns and how they can get help not only from Lone Star Legal Aid, but your organization as well. Natalia, I'll toss it to you. Sure. Uh, so, Danelle, let's kind of start uh, with you here with the first question. You kind of put me on the spot, but that's okay. Uh, you kind of gave us an overview of your program. Uh, who really is an ideal candidate for it, though? Typically, um, we're looking for someone who's uh, trying to improve their lifestyle. Um, what the OFA has done um, through the Fatherhood Initiative is try to blend uh, what they call healthy marriage, uh, that's relationship-based, and economic stability that comes to play, our, our, our employment piece comes into play. So most of the gentlemen that we, uh, we enroll either are trying to be a better father, uh, trying to improve their communication with the, the, the mother of their child, or they're, they're looking for employment. And so through our healthy marriage piece and our economic stability piece, 
we can provide that service and the, that assistance to those those dads. So if they fall within that group, and obviously if they're 18 or over and they have a child, a zero to 24, which most of our participants um, have on a casual basis, um, that's what they're, th that would be the individual that we're looking for. Okay, well, thank you very much for that little brief overview of that. And then I guess I can switch to, to Colin uh, now. Um, how is a, a father figure going to know when it's time to look for your assistance? Um, I think, you know, men, we, we can be prideful. We can be stubborn. A lot of the time, if you tell us to do one thing, we're going to do it the other way. If you tell us to do it the easy way, we're going to go the hard way. And so I think it's more so kind of falls that it's when the dad's ready. Uh, it doesn't matter what age your child is or how long you've been, you've been a father or, or parenting. Um, it comes time. You can, it's never too late to start, start parenting. Obviously you want to catch them in the formative years at zero to five range. Um, but it's never too late, whether it's a grandparent that may have not been, very heavy in their own child's life, but wants to be have a heavier impact and a more crucial role in their grandchild's life. Um, or you see those instances where um, a gentleman didn't have a dad growing up. And so kind of stepping into that role on his own to make sure that that child doesn't, you know, go through the same traumatic experience or have those lack of memories that he does. And kind of having, you know, the title fatherhood um, program kind of leads into our next question that I know Susan wanted to ask you guys. What are some common misperceptions about your program? Because now as our viewers are getting a taste of what your office has to offer, there may be some misconceptions out there. So let's get those out of the way right away. Um, I know the the first, I know there's two that we, we have down here and I'll go ahead and cover the, the first. The, the first is that the program, the program is 100% free. Uh, a lot of the times when we're discussing with the gentleman or at a recruiting event or a, a community event, a lot of time it's what's the catch? Um, you know, what, what's the cost of it? What's the, basically what is the commitment to it? And it is free of charge. Uh, all we ask for is your time, your willingness to participate, um, wanting to engage and be a better, obviously put your better in a family, your family in a better situation. Sorry. Um, and so a lot of the time that's one thing is, is always, I think there's some type of cost associated, um, when it actually is indeed free. And then I know Donnell was going to cover the other, sorry to throw you on the spot there. So uh, a lot of a lot of the dads, um, since most of the social services or what the interpretation is, is that they're for mom and for the children. Um, this program is for fathers. Um, I know that the the father figure uh, scope is now more broad than ever. You know what a man or a father looked like when when I was a child is not the same as what my son is experiencing in the world that he sees today. So. The object, object is to, uh, um, the objective is to improve the lifestyle of the children uh, and the partner, um, but um, we're, not, we're not shy about our approach that we're for dads. This uh, program is for dads, the curriculum is for dads, and we want to be able to empower our dads, um, heighten their awareness, and um, get them to kind of, you know, have some self-reflection as to how they're living their life and how that's impacting their children. So. Um, it does impact mom, but the services are for dads. Empowerment and awareness, I think, are both really important in lots of family situations. Um, I think Natalia has a question for you about uh, other benefits. Absolutely. Uh, now, Colin, what would you say is the biggest advantage that a father figure can get by finding and looking for the assistance that your program has to offer? Um, I would say it's it's the convenience and our, our availability, our flexibility. Um, we obviously know that a lot of the time dad is seen as provider. Um, a lot of times dad is that sole income. And so we want to be aware and, and conscious of that. We don't want to try to tailor our workshops to be at a time where they're either going to have to worry about taking off work um, or taking away from that that time with their family. And so we try to tailor our services with our staff to be available uh, at any given time, uh, at any point of the day. I know we've had sessions start as late as 11 p.m. Um, we've started as early as 6 a.m. And so really being as convenient for the families as possible. If you're going to work with families, you've got to meet them where they're at. We don't want to have a specified time. You've got to be here on Tuesdays and Thursdays if you miss and, you know, Sorry, and we'll, we'll catch you next week, but trying to be as, as available and open and, and transparent with them as we can be. 
Absolutely, uh, very important uh, for them to know up front. And Susan, I think you had something for Donnell, right? So Donnell, uh, if you had just one thing that you could say to help all the father figures out there who are viewing or listening to us today, what would that be? Uh, like I, I mentioned to Colin, I want it to be as organic and natural. Um, that way the gentlemen, the families that are listening, they, it, it, it can be real to them. It can be something they can relate to. Um, I came from a single parent home. I didn't meet my father until I was 15. And then we got reacquainted at 23 years old. So um, for my 12 year old son, what I've noticed is that um, I don't have to have, have all the answers. Um, you don't have to be perfect. Um, you just have to be present. Um, I was very athletic, still I am. My son thinks I'm uh, the Hulk mixed with Spider-Man, mixed with Black Panther, mixed with Captain. I mean, in, in, in his eyes, that's what he sees. Um, and he doesn't know I have knee problems, I have lower back problems, <laughs> but um, I am whatever I need to be to him. And I'm learning that um, I don't have to be the best. He doesn't have to be the best. He just needs me there to validate him, to assure him that everything's gonna be okay and to be there to experience those things with him and um, just reassure him that um, he may not feel like he's the best. He may not be at the top of the list that's on the paper, but to me, he is the best. and. That's all that children need. They just need you to be present as a dad. And um, you can figure it out. It's a journey. Fatherhood is a journey. And so that would be what I would um, suggest to the dads. That's really good advice. And it's applicable in lots of situations. Natalia, I'll toss it over to you to dig a little deeper. Absolutely, because it, it sounds like your program is designed to be able to help dads do that. In fact, uh, one of your programs is called uh, 24 seven uh, DAD or, or, or dad. Uh, Colin, can you tell us a little bit about what participating with that program looks like? Um, so there's uh, with 24 seven dad is a curriculum, th uh, a evidence-based curriculum through uh, the National Father uh, Initiative uh, or NFI. And so they have both an AM and a PM version. And so for AM, it's more so looking at you as at your past, how you were parented and how you're going to parent your children. Whereas the PM version more so kind of focuses on you as in your adult life and more as the man and the, the spouse or the partner. Um, and so the some of the topics covered in there, communication, co-parenting, discipline, showing and handle, uh, handling anger and emotions, which we know for a lot of men, these are topics that we don't discuss. And so it more so provides that platform for men to come and talk with like-minded fathers or fathers from all walks of life. And that way they can share life experiences. If there's something that a dad's going through that maybe one or two of the other fathers in the group have that this is what they did during that experience. Maybe it's something he can incorporate into his own home and his own parenting that will have that benefit for his, his family and his child. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me, um, even when I was an advocate and facilitating the curriculum was if they're to take one thing away from that curriculum, it's self-awareness. Being aware of what they say and what they do has a consequence, whether good or bad. And especially when your little one's eyes are watching, they're you know in the house, they can hear, they can see everything. And so being very aware of their presence and everything that you do and say is either one going to be replicated or to be heard and it can be misconstrued. And so you want to be more aware. And I think for a lot of men, if we were more aware of our actions, we could avoid a lot of the trouble or headaches that we bring ourselves. Amazing. Anything uh, further from you, Donnell, any other thoughts? Well, before, before I became a specialist, I was actually an advocate in Montgomery County and I, I I've seen a little bit of everything uh, my two years uh, as an advocate. Uh, I always presented the curriculum as an alternative. Um, it's a different way to look at your role as a father. Um, I know because uh, I was raised in a single parent home. Um, my father's black, my mother's Puerto Rican um, and uh, Puerto Rican moms have a really low uh, tolerance, <laughs> low threshold uh, patience. And so um, a lot of these um, teachings or suggestions or you know, ways to go about parenting that the book provided, I would have benefited from a lot. And so um, just being conscious that even though it's the, the culture that you were born into, the religion that you were raised in, some of these things are harmful to children. And it's coming to a realization that um, if it impacted you in a negative way and, and some of the you know, things that you practice today or the things that you don't practice 
or because of that negative impact that you had as a child. Uh, it's coming to the realization, like Colin said, being aware that I cannot continue this behavior. I cannot continue this, these, these, these levels of relationship with my children because you're going to get the same result. And so just, just presented it as a different alternative. It is evidence-based. So uh, in most situations, this is what will be effective. And, and hoping those dads kind of navigate those thoughts and those feelings as to, I need, I need to change the way that I'm going about doing this because I want a, I want a better result in my children's life. And just like you mentioned, because there is such a, a diverse family uh, uh, dynamic, uh, we don't all have boys, we don't all have girls, sometimes it's a mix. Uh, so that kind of leads into what I know you wanted to ask, Susan. Well, I do have to make the comment, Donnell, I just can't believe that you tested your mom's patience. <laughs> I, I don't know, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> she and I could share a lot of stories. No, oh, oh, I'll bet. <laughs> and our moms could share stories about each one of us, I'll bet. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I'm just curious, and maybe um, the viewers would like to know as well, is there a difference in parenting a daughter versus a son? What do you guys think about that? This is actually a conversation we have uh, quite a bit, because um, he does, he has a, an 11-year-old son, and I have two uh, girls, a four and a two-year-old, and so I've never parented a boy, he's never parented a girl, and so we we make those um, comparisons and trying to find those similarities, and I know, and, and I don't really think, in my opinion, it, it does. Um, obviously, with boys, you've got to be a little bit more hands-on. Uh, we're a little bit slower learners. Um, we're a little bit slower development, but we we do better being hands-on. We're girls are a little bit better, uh, you know, academically growing up, they catch on to things quicker and they need more of that nurturing side. Now I know with my daughters, my four-year-old is extremely sensitive. Um, so I know that I have to, you know, go about handling her if she's upset or when it comes to discipline in a much lighter way. So is that, you know, that it's, it's, it sticks to the discipline, you know, it's to teach her to guide and to try to find that balance. But I know with my two-year-old, that's a whole different story. Um, she's a little firecracker. And if I try to get on her, she will look at me, side, she will side eye me and just kind of look at me like I, I'm going to do it anyway. So you're just wasting your own breath. Um, but, it, and again, I, I think um, if, if we go for number three, you know, I would hope it'd be a boy. So I, I have that. I do want my boy. I'm very big into ath athletics. And as we were discussing before, I'm a huge Dragon Ball Z fan. Um, and so my, my daughters haven't really kindly taken to that yet. Um, and so, I, I, to my to my personal opinion, I don't think there really are many differences. Again, like he said earlier, I think it's just being present at home, being present at home, taking an interest in what they take an interest in. Um, again, the amount of times I've worn dresses and makeup, and the amount of Disney princess songs I've memorized, and and it's just it comes with the territory of being a parent, whether it's it's a boy or a girl. Donnell, why don't you chime in from the father of a boy perspective? Uh, I can I can echo the same. Uh, I think the approach is, is slightly different. Um, I have nieces. Uh, I've been there for all three of my nieces, uh, except the, the fourth. Um, and it's boys are kind of nonverbal. Um, my son uh, doesn't uh, replicate or mimic my my character, but he'll replicate or mimic uh, certain behaviors. Um, I always try to get through to him. Um, I I want you to be a man of character. The athletics, the the your physical appearance, that's uh, uh, that's not as important as who you are inwardly. And so um, he literally he just turned twelve. He's um, five eight and a half. He's two hundred twenty pounds. He is a very uh, large person, <laughs> and so he's a gentle giant. And I try to um, empower those characteristics and teach him to be compassionate and understanding and kind you know just because you're bigger than everybody or because you're in advanced classes you know to to not diminish people and uh you, the athletics will come the the physique will come you know the the looks will come and it's just more of sharpening him uh his character and it takes conversation so i, I think a lot of you know what Colin might have more ease with having conversations and and being being able to sit down and have a cognitive a conversation uh, is it might be a little harder <laughs> because he's going into this teenager phase where he's like you know kind of quiet and reserved and he wants his space and this is my stuff so uh, I think it's the same they're they're made of flesh and they have hearts and they're you know children are wonderful 
boys are just like Colin said, they're they're a little <laughs> they're a little slow. So you gotta you, you know you have to be patient with them. We all need patience from everybody around us. Natalia, what do you have for our guests? Well, especially uh, since Susan and I work uh, with a legal organization, Lone Star Legal Aid, we see a lot of family cases that, that come through our office um, and the, having to deal with, with custody and visitation. I know that we shared um, an article from Psychology Today uh, and a couple thoughts uh, with, with you, Colin and Donnell. Um, there was actually an article in uh, June 2021 uh, that really talked about the importance uh, that the father has in child development. And it reported that, you know, regardless of whether they live together, um, as we see sometimes in custody issues, you know, we have shared custody uh, with the children, uh, but that children who have regular positive contact with their father, you know, tend to regulate their emotions better than the children who have no contact with the father. Now, if, now for you guys, what does that mean and why is it important, do you think? I'm going to let you start that one off, Dee. For me, um, my my journey as a father uh, started off rocky. I was uh, a great provider, but I was not a good dad. I was not present. Um, I may have picked up my son from daycare a handful of times. Um, I wasn't focused um, at that time. Uh, that wasn't important to be a good dad. I, I believe that um, me maturing, um, uh, you know, me having a, a kind of a change of life with faith and and uh just getting older <laughs> my hair falling out um i just uh I, I created a balance in in the household composition i i do co-parent with his mother but i've chosen uh to take the the low road um to meet her wherever she is um to not necessarily complain about what i can't change but just try to find a solution um there are certain things that she won't back down from, and uh, I'm there to be the one to nurture my son. There are certain things that I'm not going to back down, and she'll be the nurturing parent. So uh, it's just um, having two sets of eyes on on their relationship, um, doing what's best for the child's interest. Um, we come from two different cultures, two different backgrounds, and just making it's a decision that you make as a man, as a father to do whatever it is possible within a reasonable means, that's what's best for your child. Um, I choose peace, I tell people I choose peace over war. Um, me and Colin talk about it every day and he tells me, man, I just, I live to fight another day. And so if it's, you know, pulling back from an argument, um, your stance or your opinion, um, you do it for the child's sake. If you love your children, if you wanna see your children flourish, if you wanna see your children grow, and be people who can who can uh, add something wonderful to your your, your community, and uh, you know be what you what you felt like you you could have been if some things would have been different. I think about those things. I meditate on those things. And before I speak, before I do something, before I let my my anger uh, take over me um, or my frustration, uh, I put my child first. And so that's that's what needs to happen a lot of times with fathers in these relationships. Mom may not be the easiest person to deal with, but you can find some resolution and solution to what 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 differences you have if you if you really try. And I, like I said, I agree with you know you've it's one parent goes high, one goes low. You've got to have that balance. We can't both go in as bad cop um, if we're both frustrated or tired or and everybody has those days where from work and life and you know trying to get the kids ready for dinner and then bath time in bed and you're both tired mentally and physically it's very easy to let those emotions kind of take over. Um, and sometimes, like I said, we, you know, both parents want to get on to them or you've got to have that, that balance. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that, that awareness that they're, you know, my own daughter's four and two years old They're you know, they're still learning. It's, it's as frustrating as it can be. It's about them. It's for what's in their best. It's better for me to maybe step away for a minute. It's better to let my wife take the, the harsher, you know, approach and let me kind of fall back and kind of nerd more. So the nurturing, um, and so it's having that understanding between you and your, your spouse or your partner as well. Um, kind of knowing each other's ticks, knowing kind of each other. I know some days if I walk in and 
I look at my wife before I even speak. I know the eyes I get. It's like, let me let her talk first today. Um, and so it's understanding that and our kids are going to have bad days too. And I think a lot of the time uh, we kind of jumped a gun um, on the, either while the discipline are getting on to them, because again, we, they're learning. They don't know how to regulate their emotions. We are a grown adults and have time, a hard time regulating our emotions. Um, and so I think it's having that balance and knowing, like, it's like he said, you know, no one to live to fight another day. Not everything is at the end of the world what may seem like a big deal in the moment you take five minutes away from and you realize how small or petty it was and how little significance it actually has. And so, uh, I, again, I think the, the real key is having that, that balance. Absolutely. And I know that article had a few more points that we wanted to touch on. Uh, Susan, I believe you had a question about it, didn't you? Thanks, Natalia. I do. Um, that online article from Psychology Today also takes the position that a father can influence a child's well-being indirectly um, just through his relationship with the child's mother. Um, we know that conflict between parents is detrimental to children's well-being and uh, supportive co-parenting relationships, by contrast, are related to fewer behavior problems in children. Emotions run high between parents when a relationship ends and there ends up being a suit um, that we call in the legal field, a suit affecting the parent-child relationship um, or a divorce. So my question is, how is a supportive co-parenting relationship even possible in these highly emotionally charged situations? Colin? Um, it, it's going to boil down to it's, as, as we've mentioned, it's putting the needs of the child first, uh, putting their well-being first. It can be tough, um, in split households or divorced households. Um, my wife comes from a divorced household. My, my parents are, are still married to this day. And so it's, it's difficult because you obviously have had a relationship with your ex or your ex partner or spouse. And so it's difficult. Sometimes you want to let that kind of take hold and let those emotions run high instead of seeing what the big picture is for, for your child. Again, I think a lot of time we get wrapped up in our own selves. Um, I think a lot of times we are selfish creatures by nature. Um, and so it, it's difficult to put that aside and really think what's the best for the child in this moment. Um, and so I think in that instance, that's the best advice I can give is just think about what's best for the kids. Um, Donnell may have another uh, take at this um, that may be a little bit better worded. Um, It's a, I mean, because of the situation, um, it's a sacrifice. I don't think it's a sacrifice unless it's going to cost you something. Um, pride, ego. Um, you know, I, I was, I've been saying something uh, recently. I'd say, you know, everybody's a hero in their own story. And so, I mean, you, you read the Bible, God's the hero in his own story. <laughs> um, it's, it's a choice that you make and it's a choice that you make. Uh, daily, um, just because you were born into a place or, or even born into this flesh into your body, um, you have to make a choice to be that person. Um, you have to choose to want to uh, improve your child's life. You have to choose that even though something negative happens, doesn't mean that you have to have a negative outcome. You know, divorce is is something where you know two people have come through a, a fork in the road and they do, they no longer want to continue together. But we have a child together. Um, it's a lot of times like that. There are very, very many institutions. You, you go to college, you take out a student loan. Um, you may not be in college, but they're going to ensure that you pay that student loan because it's going to follow you everywhere. So you take that approach. Um, it's a cognitive decision that you make in your heart and in your mind that I'm going to choose peace. I'm going to set aside my indifferences and sit down. It's something different when you sit down and you listen to somebody and they actually see that you're invested in how they feel and how they think. Um, as you can tell, I was raised by a woman. <laughs> um, I had a lot of sit downs and, and now being a parent, now being you know, in my mid thirties, I understand my mother at a level that I wish I could have just you know, shut up you know, for, for a couple of those moments and learn from her and glean from her. And I think things in my early twenties would have went better. So if people could kind of sit down and hear out each other, you know, not necessarily understand each other, it's giving a person the time to let you know how they feel, you know, and, and, and be conscious of it. It's not necessarily, uh, I've never faced, uh, say, for instance, incarceration, or there's th things that I haven't experienced, but 
giving people the room to, to talk about their problems and be conscious that what, what is happening to them has hurt them. I think that that'll help levels, you know, parents just choosing to sit down and listen to each other, hear each other out. And if they want to continue to part ways that we're going to agree upon this one thing that we're going to do whatever's in the best interest of our child. That's a good rule of thumb um, for all of these kinds of legal situations. Um, Natalia, I think you have uh, some more food for thought for us. Yeah, I, I kind of thought it would be a good way to kind of wrap up our conversation by, by uh, kind of examining an expression that we may have heard uh, throughout the course of our lives. Um, there's a, an expression that says that a father is someone that you will look up to no matter how tall that you grow. Uh, for you guys, what does that mean in terms of real life? Uh, for me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 29. Um, and I, I still seek validation for my dad. Um, he was hard on me growing up, but he never missed any school function, any practice, any lesson, any game, any tournament. He worked seven days a week, sun up to sundown, but he was always, always there. And I value his opinion, honestly, more than anybody's. And so I, I again, I'll be seeking validation until, you know, I'm 90 years old from him. Um, cause you know, he, he, he's never going to die. You know, he's an outlive me. And so I will, I'll always be seeking for that validation, that confirmation from him. So I think that as, as a role, I know that's the approach I want to take with my own kids is that I will always be there for them, no matter what, um, whatever help they need assistance, or even if like, you know, Donnell just mentioned, even if it's just to listen to their problems or, or to, to let them voice their opinion, then I, I want to be that person and be there for that. And how about you, Donnell? I've had uh, two father figures in my life, my, um, my uncle and, and then my grandfather, uh, my mother's father. Um, he's about five, ten-ish. I'm 6'2", um, but when I stand next to him, I feel small. Um, he, he went to maybe the third grade. He, uh, my grandmother taught him how to read and write when he was 34. And so um, just a person with no formal education, uh, he built... Uh, the house that he lives in with his bare hands. Um, can't really speak English, but he, he understands everything. Um, and then me being able to um, be here, be a part of this program, um, graduate high school, um, working on a degree. And when I'm, when I'm next to him, when I'm around him, I still feel small. I still feel inferior. I still feel like I'm so behind because uh, of the inward man, the character that he displays, um, him being a father of eight daughters, um, grandfather of 30, 30 something grandkids, and now we're working on 20 something great great grandkids. So it's like, um, I, I asked him, How do you do this? You know, how, how do you have the heart, the, the, the conscious? You know, my grandmother's been, been gone since 2002, so he's, he's been widowed for years, and, and he still has a smile on his face. You know, we come if we need money, if we need prayer, if we need advice just trying to replicate that behavior. Uh, there's a, a biblical uh, scripture that I go by, you know, the student can never be uh, better than the master, or greater than the master, but if he's well taught, he'll be like the master. And so that's the behavior that I want to um, model, his behavior, being loving and caring and kind, and then transcend that behavior onto my child that um, I may not be able to get to, you know, that, that level of greatness or, or that heroism, but I want to be like my grandfather and, and just, being, being conscious that it's okay, it's, it's okay to not have all the answers, it's okay to not be the best parent, be the best father, you know, have the best job, but uh, if you're there, if you're supportive, if you're loving, if you're kind, and if you're understanding, those things will work themselves out. Well, those are amazing thoughts to, to carry, and I know the both of you uh, try to help the father figures that come to you to in encourage them to feel the same way. Now, we, we've talked about the candidates, um, some of the reasons why they should search out your services. Um, Colin, could you share with us uh, where they can go um, when they're looking up, trying to find out more about fatherhood? Yes, ma'am. Um, and if y'all are able to see that. And so uh, as far as for like the contact information, um, Mr. Donnell is also our intake specialist, uh, so he is the person you will speak to um, if you call to enroll or have any questions about the program. Um, so his contact number is 832-401-6180, uh, or you can reach him at ezel at medinc.org. 
Um, and then below that are also the eight counties that we service. Amazing. And uh, obviously, uh, as well for Lone Star Legal Aid, we, we overlap quite a few of those of those counties here and around the Montgomery uh, area. So definitely uh, want those fathers to know that if they're facing um, a legal issue that involves any type a family separation, whether that be family, eviction, death, uh, any type of situation where they either have to step up as a father, become a father figure, uh, that they have that program resource in your program, the, the fatherhood uh, program through MET, uh, as well as Lone Star Legal Aid. We're gonna have all of those websites in the chat uh, that you can look at and and click and click on uh, to be able to find out more information or to apply for Lone Star Legal Aid's services. So we appreciate having both of you uh, with us today to give a little bit more uh, light on what your program entails. I don't think it can be said that it's a very important program uh, for the fathers in our counties uh, to be able to serve uh, and look for those resources. So again, we appreciate you and thank you so much to everyone who tuned in to learn a little bit more.